Ani, hello, I'm Habiba Haq, the Alumni Engagement Officer at York University. Thank you for joining us for a conversation on indigeneity and student success. We're happy to offer this alumni panel to you today, both in recognition of Indigenous History Month and in celebration of Indigenous Peoples Day, this year marking the 25th anniversary. I want to acknowledge the land York's campuses are built on. As this event is virtual and we are not all gathered in the same space, I recognize that the following land acknowledgement might not be for the territory that you are currently on. If this is the case, please take the responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory you are on and the current treaty holders. Nativeland.ca is a resource to do this. This land acknowledgement also applies to the territory upon which I am currently situated. As a member of the York University community, I recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of the university itself. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Tecoronto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. I'm grateful for the opportunity to live and work on Treaty 13 land. We also want to recognize the Indigenous Framework for York University, which was developed to increase our engagement with and to further provide a range of educational services for Indigenous communities. One of the principles outlined in the framework is to enhance the academic success of Indigenous students. Their wellness and journey to success are the focus of today's panel and which the Indigenous Alumni Network is pleased to be offering in partnership with the Center for Indigenous Student Services. If at any time you need help with this Zoom webinar experience, feel free to click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and enter your question and our team will be ready to help you. That same button can be used to submit questions for our guest speakers to answer during the Q&A period following today's panel. With that, I'm excited to welcome a familiar face to, to many, Randy Kitanamakwat, the manager of the Center for Indigenous Student Services, a member of the Indigenous Council, and who was a member of the writing committee that developed the Indigenous Framework. Please join me in welcoming Randy to the screen. Thank you. Thank you, Habiba. <clears throat> Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to this uh, panel session on a conversation on indigeneity and student success. This, uh, this event is, um, is uh, a collaboration between the York University Indigenous Alumni Network, the Center for Indigenous Student Services, and the um, uh, Alumni Engagement Office. Um, we also invited three York Indigenous uh, alumni who, will you, who you will meet shortly. And uh, it's great to have these events here where we can um, invite and engage our, our alumni to, um, to um, showcase, to, uh, to um, network with our uh, current students and to hear from them on, on their successes since they uh, uh, graduated. So next I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Janine Manning, who is one of our uh, co-chairs on the, uh, the alumni network. Janine Manning is a Anishinaabe and a member of the Chippewas of Nawash First Nation and a co-chair of the York University Indigenous Alumni Network. She is a graduate of the Environmental Studies Program and holds an honors uh, degree uh, in arts that she received in 2013. She is the Senior Manager of the Indigenous Collaboration and United Way Greater Toronto Area uh, and a new uh, Laidlaw Foundation President. So with that, I'd like to welcome Janine. Uh, miigwech, uh, Habiba and Randy for that um, beautiful welcome. I'm here today as the co-chair of the York University Indigenous Alumni, as Randy mentioned. And I will be introducing for you the moderator and our panelists. Our moderator is Sean Hillier. He is a queer Mi'kmaq scholar from the Halapu First Nation. He is an assistant professor at the School of Health Policy and Management, co-chair of the Indigenous Council 
and a special advisor to the Dean of the Faculty of Health on Indigenous Resurgence, achieving his BA in 2010 and his MA in 2011. Our panelists are Megan Scribe, Inanu Iskwe from Norway House Cree Nation, achieving a BA in 2011 and MA in 2013. Um, she is an interdisciplinary and Indigenous feminist researcher, writer, and educator. Scribe is an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at Ryerson University. Scribe is a community council member for Aboriginal Legal Services Community Diversion Program and was a planning committee member for Walking With Our Sisters in Toronto in 2018. Benjamin Van Dorp, they, he, achieved a BA, a BA in Environmental Studies in 2012 and a Juris Doctorate in 2015 from Osgood, is a two-spirited trans queer in a, based in, could you, I'm going to say this wrong, uh, Jabuk Tuk. Benjamin is the founder of the nonprofit organization Justice Trans, which provides free legal information and education about uh, two-spirited, non-binary, and transgender rights across Canada. They are also the acting transition navigator for Atelier Inuit, a nonprofit organization that provides cultural programming and supports for Inuit in the Maritime Provinces. Our third panelist is Jonathan LaRose, who holds a Bachelor's in Fine Arts, achieved in 2017, is a Canadian-born actor of Italian and Ojibwe descent, he is a third generation Indigenous artist from the Nipissing First Nation. Jonathan began acting professionally in film and television in 2011 in the CBS series Salvation. His most notable, notable performance to date is as Dirk, leader of the Sidiots in Belle Crave TV's hit show, Letter Kenny. Chimik Wetch for you all to, to you all for being here. And now I'll turn it over to Sean. Chimik Wetch. Thank you so much, Janine. Kwe, Ani, Tenzi, and good afternoon. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for this exciting panel and to my colleagues for organizing and participating on it. On this National Indigenous Peoples Day during Indigenous History Month and Pride Month, I am honored to be speaking alongside Benjamin, Megan, and Jonathan during our conversation on indigeneity and student success. But I'd like to start by acknowledging the significant difficulties we have faced during this past year. COVID-19 has meant a change in our way of life and for some, it has meant the loss of loved ones and friends, all while we cannot be together or in ceremony. On top of this, we have been reminded of the atrocities associated with residential schooling in Canada. The findings of mass graves in Kamloops, BC, and now at other schools across this country. This has been a distressing time for Canadians and continues to cause trauma for Indigenous people specifically. However, we have, and continue to be resilient in the face of these traumas. Throughout my time, uh, throughout this time, my colleagues and Indigenous peoples in our York community have continued to advance the work and build relationships with our communities, increase our knowledge around languages and our knowledges. Our alumni have advanced the voices of Indigenous peoples and equity seeking groups in Canada and around the world. I want to thank the Indigenous Alumni Network for their work in putting together this panel today and being a strong, consistent voice for Indigenous alum at York University. There has been so much to be proud of in terms of progressing Indigenous activities and recognition across York University. Our colleague, Alan Corbier, just this past week was named a Canada Research Chair. In July, we'll be launching the Institutional Organization, an organized research center, the Center for Indigenous Languages and Knowledges here at York. And my colleagues have also received significant grants to work with Indigenous communities throughout the country. We have students progressing through their degrees, and I've been, I've had shared stories of great successes of our students from securing great jobs and positions in graduate and professional schools to advancing into senior management and government roles. Congratulations to all of them. Additionally, our staff continue to be the backbone of our community and support all of us in so many ways. And I want to give so much thanks to them and Randy and our staff at the Center for Indigenous Student Services specifically. However, we still have much work to do. We have faculties on our campus that have no Indigenous faculty members. We need to ensure greater representation so students see themselves reflected in those that teach them. 
We need to build stronger community engagement. We need better resources and tools in the recruitment of Indigenous students and supports for our Indigenous community members. Many of us here today, along with colleagues across campus, are working hard to progress the priorities of the Indigenous Council and the framework. I want to thank members of the senior leadership here at York for their continued support of the Indigenous Council and the work that is being done. I hope that we can continue to count on allyship as we continue to progress these initiatives. Speaking of allyship, today we will be discussing that very topic. And I must foreground the need for strong allies to move beyond performance and into action. This includes gaining greater knowledge about the historical and contemporary lives of Indigenous peoples, including our rich cultures and communities. I am very much looking forward to hearing from our panelists as they speak on the topic of Indigeneity and student success. Again, thank you for joining us. I'd like to start off with our first question that I'll pose to Megan. Can you tell us a bit about yourself and how your varying identities and intersections of them have shaped your journey at and after York? Hi, Sean, thank you so much for your great introduction and thoughtful questions. And before I respond, I just wanna thank all of the organizers who made today possible. Um, so my name is Megan Scribe. I'm Two-Spirit in a New Esquil from Norway House Cree Nation. And I think it's important that I make clear that this is a Northern remote First Nation in Manitoba. Um, so to get to Norway House, you actually have to take a ferry, right? So it's not just down the road. Uh, so what else do you need to know about me? I'm mixed. My late father was white, uh, so I identify as a white native, but I also identify as Holy Cree. For me, uh, being Cree is very much about my nationality. Uh, it is not um, something that can be quantified or classified as the white settler state has attempted to and continues to do so. That said, I do think it's important to locate myself in the way that I'm seen uh, as I move through this world. Um, so what else do I need to say in terms of um, who I am and how that's shaped? So like I said, uh, I'm from a Northern remote First Nation community, and that played a significant role in my journey to York. So I come from a place where the dropout rate in grade nine is quite significant. And so uh, to have graduated from high school in the first place is a massive achievement. I graduated in 2007 in a class of 28. Um, and it was such an honor to be able to graduate at home in my community with my family, with my peers. Uh, this is um, for many Canadians, something they take for granted, but for First Nations uh, folks like myself, uh, you can't count on actually going to a high school in your community. So I think that's worth noting. The decision to go to York was uh, huge. It caused a lot of stress in my life. It was uh, a source of great excitement. Um, I definitely was not encouraged to leave Manitoba to go to school, uh, let alone go to Toronto. Um, I didn't have a lot of institutional support when I left home. And I think just in general, there's this expectation that, um, you know, you're lucky to have graduated high school and why would you even why would you even try and push further why don't you just you know like stay stay close to home so um I think that is a really big part of my post-secondary education was this feeling that I had to push against social expectations uh as someone from the res um and then being at York uh, as someone from a community of, I think it was 5,000 people at the time, uh, to going to uh, one of the most populous cities in Canada, it was quite overwhelming. I, um, the, the population at York was, I don't know, 10 times the size of Norway House, um, so uh, a bit overwhelming. Uh, but the reason why I was so successful, I think, through my post-secondary is because um, while I 
didn't necessarily get a lot of social support to leave home for Toronto. I did receive band funding. So that financial support as a First Nations person made this possible. So I don't think that I would have been as successful at York if I didn't have the financial support of my community. Um, I'll leave it there for now uh, because I'm excited to hear from my other panelists. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Megan. And before we jump over to Ben, I just want to note that closed captioning is available for this presentation and that if you have any questions and or if you have any questions for the panelists, please feel free to drop them in at any time in the Q&A panel and we'll get to those in the last 15 minutes of today's event. Uh, ben. Nakumi, thank you. Uh, my name is Ben. My pronouns are they and he. I'm currently based in Chibuktuk. I grew up here, but my family is, uh, my the Inuit side of my family, as I'm mixed white as well, is from Nunatsiavut, which is uh, the Inuit land claim in Labrador. Um, I'm also trans and queer. So um, oftentimes when I'm thinking about my identity, how I move through the world, I'm thinking about kind of walking a fine line almost between two worlds in terms of being mixed Inuit and white and also um, having been assigned female at birth and then transitioning to male and how people's interactions change as I progressed through my transition. Um, so obviously those identities have informed a lot of my decisions in life and uh, you know, including to move to Toronto from Halifax, which Dubuque, which is um, one of the smaller cities in Canada. Um, I moved there not knowing anyone, not really um, having those family or um, collegial supports that others might have. Um, so I sort of threw myself in and thought, okay, it's sink or swim. And thankfully, I made some really great connections through student groups at York um, that allowed me to kind of find my rhythm and begin to thrive um, to the point that I went on to uh, complete a law degree at Osgood. Um, and those skills helped me move out into the world as an indigenous and queer and trans person and found my own nonprofit. Now I help run another one. Um, and I'll be moving on into a policy position um, at the beginning of next month with ITK. Um, so I think that's a rough rundown of where I stand and, and my experience. So I'll pass this over to Jonathan. Miigwech. Um, Ani Bujo. My name is Jonathan LaRose. Um, I'm in Anishinaabe from Nipissing First Nation. Um, I was recently given my Anishinaabe name, which is Nishnamananan by an artist, Jonathan Fitcher, who, uh, which roughly translates into the man who sleeps twice or informally two sleeps. Um, like Megan and Ben, I, my indigeneity comes with this walking the line of the world where I'm very visibly perceived as a white man. Um, and having the experiences and um, <clears throat> the history and heritage of my indigenous relatives, um, that has very greatly affected me and shaped the journey through York and through my life because I am um, forced to kind of listen and experience things under this kind of guise of looking like something that I'm not in both worlds. Um, for me, a very, very hard part of my journey, which was really, really helped and, and kind of came alive at York was fully owning my indigeneity. Um, my experiences come from my grandmother who had to um, had the same situation as me where she looked visibly a certain way, had to escape res life, um, come to the city, have a family here. But all of those um, histories lived within us, but 
for her, it was uh, a survival technique to kind of force those things to be as invisible as possible in order to thrive in a world that um, accepts only a certain type of person. So for me, knowing that and then trying to step foot into a world which I very much recognize as my own while feeling very um, out of place has been my main struggle and journey at York, which has been, you know, something that has defined me as a person um, and how I am nowadays. So um, that's, you know, I'll kind of end it there and we'll pass on to the next question. Excellent. Thank you for that, Jonathan. Uh, and you're going to lead our next question off as well. Um, and so this question has a lot of meaning to me and I think to lots of the panelists uh, who come from small towns and communities into this massive institution. I grew up in like rural Newfoundland on the island of like 300 people um, to an institution that has a population of over 75,000 now um, on a non-COVID day. And so how can students, and so specifically Indigenous students, best think about setting themselves up for success at university, especially in kind of the context of these large um, urban campuses such as York? So I'll toss that over to you first. Thank you. So for me, coming to York, being the first person in my family to go to post-secondary school, I was trailblazing from the get-go from finding out how to apply to university to finding out how to get to campus everything was uh, i was in kind of like survival mode trying to figure out what to do what i was in the theater um in the theater kind of um orientation they had spoken about financial support for people at the York University and I luckily attended this one seminar which changed my whole life and experience at York. I was able to find out how to that there was a center for Indigenous students at York. Um, it was called CAS at the time. I very quickly um, made myself home there. Um, they also had a lot of facilities there to kind of for printing services, computer services, information. And I started to um, really utilize all of the things that were um, available to me, which then allowed me to kind of um, um, learn more and more and more and then find ways to kind of established myself so from a, coming from a, a very neurotic place of zero foundation in a university really paying attention to you know the orientations finding the centers listening to things attending as many of these things I had a very strict schedule at York as well but attending as many of these open kind of um, information sessions as possible for me was uh, the the defining moment of the success at York because I went to York with a, a thousand dollars in my pocket and a dream and managed to find a way to you know graduate a, a, a four-year bachelor program which was not in the cards for me so just um it, so what I would say to Indigenous students is find that find the center, find the students association. Unfortunately, I didn't even find out that there was a students association until much later. And I wish I would have earlier because I would have been able to be more involved. That was able to kind of like take me further once I ran out of options. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Megan or Ben, do you have anything to add? Megan. Thanks, John. And thanks, John. You did such a fantastic job answering. I think you said a lot of the things that I was thinking myself and a lot of your experiences uh, I share. I want to um, flip the question a little just to add a new dimension to it and just ask how can universities set Indigenous students up for success? I think that um, given the uh, incredible resources available uh, at universities, it, it makes a lot of sense to start there. Um, so 
if we're thinking about how universities can support Indigenous students um, even better, uh, I would, I'll start by thinking about um, the Center for Indigenous Student Services. So uh, like Jonathan, I was, I think I was also at York when it was CAS. Um, I don't know, is the acronym KISS or SIS? Uh, let's, uh, let's, let's just say KISS. Um, so when I started at York in 2007, the center hadn't actually uh, received um, the amount of funding that it, it did uh, a few years after I arrived. So in 2007, the Center for Indigenous Student Services was in the basement of the Health and Nursing Environmental Studies building. It was two rooms, I believe it was, um, uh, the coordinator's office and a small computer room. Um, and it was a lovely space. Randy, the, the coordinator then, uh, was the first person I met uh, when I moved onto campus. And I felt really supported. And it just felt really good to see uh, another Indigenous person in the city where indigeneity can be very invisible. Um, that said, because there wasn't a lot of support and resources allocated to this center in 2007, uh, it wasn't able to support me in all the ways that I needed to. So for example, if I needed writing support, I would uh, go to the writing center for all of the students. And this had mixed results given my unique educational background prior to post-secondary. So I believe it was in 2009 that um, the center received Ministry of Training, College and University funding and the budget just, it, 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 was, it was like 180. Um, the center went from being two rooms in the basement at York to having, um, you know, being on the second floor, you know, uh, many different rooms, it became the hub. And I think in 2009 is when I started to see all of these Indigenous students uh, come together. And I was like, were you always here? Uh, I didn't meet a lot of Indigenous students who started in 2007, like me until two years later when the funding was allocated for us to support our gathering. So I think that's really important. So ensuring that there's the adequate resources and support available to uh, these initiatives. I think another important thing in terms of uh, Indigenous student success is I want to see people uh, in uh, education roles, administrative roles, who look like me or will look like members of my family, not necessarily me, um, or have similar experiences as me or um, my other Indigenous peers. So uh, it really meant a lot when York began hiring more Indigenous faculty. And I would like to see this trend continue. I think it's important for students to see themselves reflected in the classroom. I, I, I will share a less positive experience where I did take an Indigenous studies course taught by a non-Indigenous person. And uh, it wasn't a violent experience, but it was a very tragic experience where the tone in this classroom was that Indigenous peoples are dying, the language is dying, and we need to do whatever we can to try and stop this. And this is really hard for someone who comes from a community where uh, Cree is the first language for many of my family members and my community members. And so I want to receive my education from maybe someone who understands that uh, it, it, can, it is very painful to be in, an indigenous person living under settler colonial occupation but it is also one of the most beautiful experiences in this world. And that isn't always reflected by non-Indigenous faculty. So that is important. And then of course, when you hire the Indigenous faculty, it's important for the university to support that faculty uh, and work on retention so that the Indigenous faculty want to stay. So supporting Indigenous faculty's initiatives. So if they want to create, um, minor program, major programs, departments, even faculties, I would encourage universities to support those initiatives because ultimately 
they create spaces for Indigenous students to find themselves. Um, and uh, one final point is that, of course, any programs, awards, or initiatives, I think it's important that they reflect students' unique life experiences. So ensuring that there's childcare opportunities for Indigenous students, if they are also parents, making sure that housing is prioritized, making sure that there's uh, different kinds of awards, and of course, offering the mentorship to students so that they have the confidence to apply for those awards. It took me a really long time to realize that a lot of awards for Indigenous students sit unclaimed because no one applied. And the reason those Indigenous students didn't apply is not because they weren't there, it's because a lot of times they didn't have the confidence or someone to walk them through that application process. So uh, it's great to have the awards, but walking students through, encouraging them to do it, that's also important. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Megan and Jonathan. I, I think you've answered a lot. I have a bunch of predetermined questions here for folks on the other end. Uh, and I think we're gonna skip over one because we've answered uh, a bunch of it and I may come back to one of the specific pieces, but I'm gonna uh, move over to Ben and ask Ben to describe your career trajectory post-graduation. And what advice would you have for other Indigenous students who are getting close to graduating? Um, yeah. So this is a, a big question, um, but I'm very happy to see that it is on the list of questions. Um, my career trajectory has not been the traditional or stereotypical kind of path post-graduation, and that initially terrified me, and now I see it as a really wonderful thing because it's given me a lot of opportunities to explore exactly where I want to be and what I want to be doing. Um, initially, I was thinking because I was graduating law school, oh, I, you know, I should go be a lawyer, go do this. Um, that's what I'm supposed to do. But it didn't feel right for me. I, my experience with law has been very much that I want to change it, but I didn't see it changing very much if I were to take on a role as a lawyer. So I decided to take a different route, which was to found a nonprofit that was based on educating people about the legal system as it is now, but also looking at policies and ways that we can change it as we move forward and hopefully move away from primarily the Western um, way of looking at things and incorporate or, um, indigenous ways, indigenous views of, um, uh, of addressing like conflict resolution or um, uh, I'm blanking on the word. I feel like, okay, I'll come back to that one um, in a minute, but finding ways to incorporate my identity in the work that I'm doing um, so that I am feeling good about it and feeling fulfilled. And that can be a really scary thing to do when you're coming out of school and maybe you have debt, maybe you have, um, you're worried about where you're gonna live, you know, how are you gonna eat that week? Um, so also giving myself the grace and time to start that very slowly while doing other work to make sure that I'm taking care of myself so that I can continue doing the work that I want to be doing in the long, long term. Um, and building slowly on that and kind of chipping away to get to where I am at this point. Um, at this point, my nonprofit is standing on its own feet, so I'm helping run another one um, that is just for Inuit. Um, specifically urban Inuit in the maritime provinces offering cultural programming and supports. Um, and now I'm going a step further with the policy aspect, which is joining ITK um, next month uh, in their policy department. And this took me six years to really like find that stride and um, there were some scary moments, but I think probably the best advice I have received was that uh, 
they say there's five years. And if you get past the five years with a goal and you're, you're still able to continue with it, you're probably going to be okay because most, if you're looking at say business or something like that, a lot of the time it will fail with within the first year or two. And five years is a good marking point of that you're on the right path with it. Um, and then also something that was really helpful that I had to learn over to, <laughs> probably the hard way is sometimes you have to let go of things that are very dear to you um, and let other people help facilitate their growth. Excellent, thank you, Ben. I saw some panelists' reaction to some of that as, uh, as very true, but I'm gonna pass it over to Jonathan for uh, his response. So echoing what um, Ben was just saying about um, acting is very, very challenging career as I've, everybody tells me. <laughs> um, and um, I think for me, um, identity, visible identity is a very important part of my job. Um, how I look, how I'm cast as, how I put myself out there uh, which we'll talk, I can talk about later in the Q&A about um, and how that's affected me. But what Ben said, which is something I truly live by after York was, York for me was a four-year degree in getting a BFA. So I thought that was the time, things are going to work out, you know, um, but you, giving yourself four to five years of that out of school time for the career to get traction you have to learn especially with acting in the world that I was in there are so many things that you have to that have to digest that take almost as long as the training period itself that's something that I was very um, that took me a long time to realize and then um, another thing was that uh, Ben had said was letting go of those precious ideals of things and what my grandmother calls letting serendipity take over was a very especially in a career where you're completely at the whim of someone else's judgment and in in, in a true form you have no control in acting as how people will perceive you um I can say or do anything and I can look like somebody that they don't like and there goes the job. So letting, letting go has been a very, very important skill um, that, I've, that I've had to learn. And it comes with um, just consistent effort and a lot of the things that I learned at York and spending a lot of time truly understanding my self and identity. Now, I'm not, not sure if that answered a lot of good points there, but I did want to just echo the two very important points that Ben said at the end, because it's very important to the success that things take their time and there's not a race, you know. Anyways, thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm going to move over to our last question. If others want to kind of tie in at any point, I'm going to pose this to all panelists and we're going to start with Megan. Um, and so today is Indigenous, or this month is Indigenous History Month. Today is National Indigenous Peoples Day. And that I know many people have joined this call to, today to participate in, in this uh, event and to uh, and would consider themselves to be allies and wanting to be good allies for Indigenous folks. Um, and so the question that, that's being posed is, I'd like to hear from the panelists about how people can be great action allies to Indigenous peoples 365 days a year. Uh, and I'm going to preface this a little bit in that. Uh, so I was teaching an intensive summer course. It finished today. It's an Indigenous health course. Uh, and so today was a discussion on allyship. And so they've learned this totality of, of you know, content for the past six weeks intensively. Um, and so now what do they do with this? And, and we talked a lot about performance uh, allyship, which I see a lot today in which you know lots of people will post about Indigenous Peoples Day 
but then there's no follow up. So to, there, there, there is no action that comes after that to truly support, to give voice to, to give space to, to, um, to really kind of prop up uh, Indigenous voices and peoples uh, any other day of the year. And so that's the question I'm going to pose back and then a bit of the, the burden that comes on uh, folks. Uh, to have to take up some of this work as well. And so Megan, uh, as a fellow academic, I will uh, that, that lovely title of, of academic, I'll, to I'll toss it over to you. You're just on mute still, sorry. It had to happen once and I'm glad it was me. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much, Sean, and congratulations on finishing your intensive. It must be such a relief and what a great note to end it on. I think that it sounds like you have a really critical bunch in your group, um, but I too, I spend a lot of time thinking about allyship in my personal and my research life. Uh, I, yeah, so my approach to allyship has always been to decenter whiteness and to decenter the existing social arrangements that situate white settlers above all else. So uh, for me, uh, it means um, working against systems that have um, deliberately undermined my relationships with um, uh, uh, Black Indigenous kin, Black communities, um, other racialized communities. Uh, and I, I also, uh, in order to decenter whiteness, besides uh, working against those um, attempts to undermine my relations with other kin, is I think about how is a white supremacist state established and maintained? How does that even happen? Uh, so for me, it, it happens through the interconnection of a number of different systems, including but not limited to settler colonialism, uh, slavery, and anti-Black racism. A uh, little known fact is that there was slavery in Canada for a significant amount of time. Um, and then of course, xenophobia. And Canada uh, has a long history of uh, preventing and discouraging the immigration of people, uh, racialized folks uh, until um, like officially until like the 70s and then unofficially it continues today, right? So uh, it's important for me to, to work on these relations and then to also think about these interlocking systems that might not directly affect me, but because um, they affect someone else, um, you know, let me put this a little bit more straightforward. My liberation is bound up with the liberation of all oppressed peoples. Um, and so uh, when I think about allyship, I think of it in terms of reciprocity. I think that it needs to be a balanced relationship. A lot of times when we think about allyship in this more dominant discourse, is it's um, like Sean was saying, it can be performative. I think it also plays into existing power dynamics that um, situate white settlers above uh, BIPOC. And so for me, when I push back against that, that dominant belief of what allyship is, it's my attempt to undermine these power dynamics to try and create a more equitable playing field um, and then also, of course, it's pushing, a, it's pushing back against the assumption that allyship is about white settlers and Indigenous folks. Um, so because allyship does tend to be bogged down with all of these assumptions and these power dynamics, I've moved away from the language of allyship in my research life. I prefer the language of co-conspirator. And uh, I have co-conspirators uh, from within Indigenous communities um, and uh, through my collaborations with Black feminist scholars, with Palestinian feminist scholars, um, we work to co-conspire uh, and this is consensual, this is reciprocal, and this is mutually beneficial. This isn't a top-down I'm going to uh, deliver you instructions and you are going to um, 
undo the conditions that your ancestors created. It doesn't, that's not allyship for me. Um, and so uh, I think, oh, I forgot I should credit, I wanna credit the indigenous feminist scholar. So Kristen Simmons is the, the scholar who um, developed the, the concept co-conspirators in the way that I use it. I highly recommend you follow up with their um, blog post article. The title is failing me right now, but Kristen Simmons is the scholar. So before I just wrap up my response, I, um, in the spirit of co-conspirators, uh, I, I had the privilege of attending my uh, partner's um, uh, panel discussion a few years ago. So uh, she's um, uh, Palestinian and was doing work around Palestinian indigenous uh, solidarity. And at this panel, she pointed out to all of us there um, that the apartheid system that exists in Israel, it was modeled and designed after the apartheid system that existed in South Africa. And that apartheid system in South Africa was modeled and designed after the systems that existed here in Canada, including reserves and residential schools. Um, and so my partner, May Ella, was said so poignantly, our oppressors are talking to one another. So why aren't we? Why aren't we talking to one another? And that really stayed with me. And I, um, I use that to guide me in the work and the relations I create. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Uh, I'm going to go to Jonathan and Ben. But again, if anybody has questions for the panelists, I see that there's one pending right now. Uh, feel free to drop those and we'll try to get to those uh, before we end time. So Jonathan, anything uh, from you on allyship? Yes. So I, I think about this concept a lot. Um, I approach it from, uh, I just also want to thank Ben and Megan for their eloquent uh, academic um, structure and the way they say things. And I apologize profusely for my more off the cuff um, anecdotal responses. They're, they're a very beautiful balance to, to what I have to say. So prefacing that, I'm going to go into kind of my story and opinions on these because they're very strong. I have many friends who, especially with recent events, have, you know, claimed allyship uh, for the sake of claiming allyship. Um, this, the main struggle I have with this concept is there is a, an unspoken rhetoric of people only providing allyship under the guise that these are a suffering people. Um, and when I, I am a very not passive person, um, neither was my grandmother or my great grandfather before that. If I am true to my um, indigenous identity, I would be Okichitao, I would be a warrior. It's just in my blood. When I, I, I make a very strong point to talk about my indigeneity as, as hard it is, as it is for me in every group situation, because I notice that people who do, if they see somebody who they don't believe is, the, if the scars aren't visible, essentially, they're less likely to talk about these issues. I've had many people claim on social media all the, all the support they'd like to give, talking about you know, informing themselves, who I've known for years, and because I'm a very specific type of personality, have never once had a conversation with me. Now, balancing that, I've also had friends, and this is where it's a good example of it. I've had friends who are, who've grown up in uh, colonial white lives, who have spent time, because they've known me, finding out information, and almost educating me on stories and things that they've learned in a true, uh, what I believe is a very indigenous way of sharing information because the culture is inclusive. It's always been inclusive. I've never once felt from my indigenous co-conspirators, which is a great, great word if I use it correctly, sorry. Um, 
that I was being judged, but from people who are not, as soon as they see me and they kind of, the questions come up. What's your, you know, is this, what's the status card? What's the percentage? What's your blood quotient? You know, who's your mother's sister's brother's aunt? And those are very, very, very frustrating things. And sorry, that's why I want to say, preface that the academic with my kind of, you know, frustration. But I think the important thing is if you truly care, you know, about these things, educate yourself in, in, in a way in which if you see somebody, you, you, you're reaching out or you, you just know about these things in a way that it's not um, keep, keeping the rhetoric that Indigenous people are these lost fawns who are there. It's a dead language of dead people. It's just, it's just not a way to allow these people to go forward in life because we need you know, indigenous youth to, to, t to throw away the passive and put themselves out there. Like I was, it took me so long to do. Uh, and I'll just kind of end with that. So thank you. <clears throat> thank you for that uh, beautiful and thoughtful response that I, I believe my, uh, the other panelists would, would say was equally as eloquent and, and well put. Um, and so thank you for that. Ben, uh, do you want to top us off on this question? And uh, I know that there are a number of, uh, of uh, other questions that are coming in. Yeah, um, I would say um, I I love Megan. I'll, I'll echo what Jonathan said. That term co-conspirators. Thank you for introducing me to that. Um, I love that because that's what outside of my more nine to five life. Um, that's sort of the community that I've been lucky to find here, where. We are building those bridges between Black and Indigenous kin and, and other uh, POC communities. Um, and I think the main thing that we get really frustrated with when we're trying to do work is people not showing up or showing up and not listening, showing up to take the selfie, say they were there, rather than showing up to do the work. Um, and I think that Jonathan and Megan beautifully covered um, some really amazing points. And that's the only one that um, I think I really wanted to bring up in relation to that. So thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you both, or both, all three of you so much for this. We're gonna move into a number of questions that are being posed. I'm just noting that there were some submitted through uh, the online chats of the Q&A, some prior, so I have a number of different places. And so if we don't get to your question, I apologize. Uh, there's a great deal of, uh, of interest. Uh, so Julie has asked, I'm interested in perspectives on how alumni can best support Indigenous students. So I guess this could be an interesting perspective of if you were if you were students still, how would you like alumni to support you? But also as alumni, uh, how do you think you can support uh, students um, and specifically Indigenous students uh, right now through that mentorship, those types of things? If anybody, um, yeah, um, I think that um, what I've what I was unable to do for the last little while and luckily ran into Randy um, at Young and Eglinton in the crosswalk when we were all allowed to be outside. Um, I, I was very involved in my own world and I needed some kind of time after York to decompress, but I, I, I knew that the main issue I was having was visibility. I was not able to get to allow these students at York. And when I was a student at York, I was not able to find um, indigenous alumni to talk about. Uh, and, and I think that open chains of communication and even this alumni network, which has already provided more for me to potentially give back in the, in, you know, the last 50 minutes and then in the last five years has been wonderful. And just, you know, as alumni, I know it's tough, but showing up, like Ben says, doing the work making it a priority, even though sometimes it's like, you know, we, I, I feel, I think it's always from, for the alumni perspective or from my perspective, it feels like, I feel like I can't do much. So what's the point? I don't do, you know what I mean? Whereas I think, no, this is enough. And I think as students, you know, 
if some, you know, we think if we were, if we talk to somebody and they don't respond right away, you know, they've shut, they've, you know, fluffed us off, but like people are busy, but we will get back to you if, if that is the case, you know, I've had people, you know, message me from York or I always take time to, to answer even little silly questions, you know, of random, you know, somebody who randomly saw me in Letterkenny one time, they said, how do you get into acting? And I was like, had the time and I just sent a random message and it's just like, you know, we will, we will answer is what I think. You know. Thank you. And uh, Julie, just as a note that um, uh, the, the answer is also, uh, or the question is also being answered um, from somebody else uh, who's writing it out. Uh, so Janine will answer you from an institutional perspective. I'm very conscious that we only have a about a minute and a half left, and there's some kind of fairly big answers. And Amanda, I really want to get to your to to your piece, but I, I fear that I'll start and we'll get cut off. Uh, so I'm actually going to go to Ben for a question that's about the flag that's behind you uh, from Susan Gap. Uh, Gapka, who I served on the board of Pride Toronto with a number of years ago. And so Susan is asking uh, if you have any knowledge around the creation of the rainbow flag behind you with the eagle feathers that are on there, and if there's any specific meaning or purpose to it. So uh, what you're seeing behind me is the two-spirit pride flag. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, this was, this is the most popular version of the flag. I know there are other versions out there. Um, but two-spirit was a term that originated in the 90s, specifically to move away from Western labels and concepts um, around gender and sexuality, but also around spirituality. Um, and I, Megan also, I don't know if you'd like to speak to it as well. I don't mean to put you on the spot, um, but that's where it comes from. Um, two-spirit, when I'm trying to explain it, I sometimes like to say it's sort of like the term queer, but not because it's not Western. It's encompassing and a, purposely a little bit ambiguous because um, it can encompass gender, sexual orientation, uh, spirituality, um, community engagement, things like that. Excellent. So, um, that's it for our panel today. I have about 30 seconds. And so I really just want to take a moment and thank Janine and Randy and the folks at Alumni York uh, for uh, inviting the four of us to have this conversation with you. And I really just want to truly um, thank Megan, Jonathan and Ben for taking time out of your day, and when I say your day, I mean both your day as well as Indigenous Peoples Day, uh, to spend time uh, with folks. Um, and that uh, I was moved by many of your answers and uh, will continue to seek to uh, push the institution in fighting for our students and for their services and programming and that slowly but surely we will continue to make change. And so thank you, Miigwech, all my relations to each of you. Thank you so much, Sean, for moderating and for sharing those valuable introductory remarks. Uh, many thanks once again to Benjamin, Megan, and Jonathan for your valuable insights and teachings, and also the authenticity in expressing yourselves, especially for your calls for non-performative allyship. As members of the York community, one of the ways that we can do this is by reviewing our responsibilities and recommendations that are outlined in the Indigenous Framework for York University. This can be found at indigenous.yorku.ca. To our audience, we'd love to know your thoughts on today's talk and also how you plan on engaging in non-performative allyship. Please share in the Q&A or email us at alumni at yorku.ca. And if you'd like more information on or are interested in joining the Indigenous Alumni Network, please contact me at alumni at yorku.ca. Thank you to Janine and the other co-chairs on the Indigenous Alumni Network for organizing this talk. Thank you to Randy and the Center for Indigenous Student Services for their support as well. For more information about student and alumni events, please visit our website at yorku.ca forward slash alumni and friends. Um, and uh, thank you and Jimmy Gretsch. I'm happy to pass it on to Janine for her closing remarks as well. My closing remarks are all for you, Habiba. This couldn't have happened. This event couldn't have um, ran so smoothly without all of your um, dedication and time and support. So chumagwech to you 
and happy National Indigenous Peoples Day to all of our guests here with us today.